Hi, and thanks for joining us again for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shadespain, and we've got a great show this evening, lots of show and tells, and some really great questions that you've sent in as well. So let's just jump right in and get started and have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So Chuck, we'll start with you. All right, I'm Chuck Voigt. Uh, I retired almost three years ago from the University of Illinois. My specialties there were vegetables and herbs, but yeah, as an undergraduate, I, I had the whole gamut of horticultural things, so I can stumble through almost anything, but vegetables and herbs would be my specialty. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, Kent. <coughs> I'm Kent Miles from Illinois Willows. We're a specially cut flower grower located in western Champaign County, and some of my specialties are flowering branches, uh, cut flowers, perennials, uh, ornamental shrubbery. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson, and I write a blog called Grounded and Growing, and my specialty, um, kind of generalist, general horticulture, but I love houseplants, and I love vegetables like Chuck. Um, so, <laughs> well, not that Chuck is a vegetable, but we both love vegetables. <laughs> that came out all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're well, off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some show and tells to get to. We're going to start with Chuck the Vegetable. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, true to my name, uh, <laughs> these are from last year, but the catalog deluge has started again this year. My favorite. And, and as the snow flies in the air, uh, gardeners' hearts warm when they see these things come in because uh, th th they're just a place to dream and, and uh, while away those spare moments that we think we have <laughs> once in a while. Um, and, and it's good to plan, you know, to get you kind of go through them, uh, you know, make a list of what you think you want. I find if I do that online, I end up buying them all <laughs> as opposed to sorting the list, which probably isn't, a, isn't, a, isn't a necessarily a good thing. Uh, but if you make lists, then you can kind of compare, you know, can I get this somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Because there's like a, a basic fee that, that you want to avoid having too many of those, so mm -hmm. you want to order from maybe a select two or three places yeah. as opposed to seven or eight because uh, you just kind of, you have to throw a lot of money at it just to get it to come because shipping is, is, mm -hmm. is, has gotten worse and worse, <laughs> especially the last five or 10 years. But it, it's wonderful to look at. You can see what's new. They usually feature what's new in the front mm -hmm. and you can uh, you know, kind of dream and plan and then hopefully get back closer to reality before you actually <laughs> get by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and do okay, and then you don't end up with uh, 10 times what you, what you really need or what you can take care of. Um, what are some tips that you have for people who are looking through these catalogs? What should you pay attention to? You know, besides the price, mm -hmm. what are some things that you should look at? Well, they can't just be pretty. <laughs> you no, have to know what no, you're... No, uh, say on tomatoes, you want to look for uh, resistances, and usually that will be capital letters that follow mm -hmm. it. Uh, they, can, they can be resistant to verticillium, which would be a V, fusarium, which would be an F, uh, N, which would be nematodes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're in a, a an old garden spot, chances are some of those things are in mm -hmm. there waiting to grasp onto your plants. And so, uh, if you can choose one that has some resistance to those things, that's a real positive because it's it's very disappointing to to pick out this this wonderful tomato that was grown by Thomas Jefferson's neighbor or whatever. <laughs> And then, and then have it succumb to something just, just as it starts to bloom and then mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it's gone. So worry about that. On the other hand, uh, <coughs> you know, just look at it at, and don't, just because something looks really good and new, mm -hmm. don't discard it necessarily if you've had a lot of success with, with something else. Mm -hmm. You know, get the smallest amounts you can get and, and, and plant them side by side. Then if it performs well side by side with what you've had success with, then you might want to consider having it as, as your main main choice. Gotcha. I keep all mine at my bedside table <laughs> and I use those little um, post-it little yeah. flags. Yeah. And there's one like on every page. I don't even know why I wasted my time <laughs> flagging because there's one everywhere. Oh, yeah. But yes, those, those get me through the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right, Kent, what did you bring? Well, uh, first show and tell, we brought in our seasonal, one of our uh, buried branches for this time of year. It's called uh, Ilex. Common name is Winterberry. And this variety is called Winter Red. Uh, we do another um, buried one. It's uh, Sparkleberry. <coughs> and then uh, Ilex, you have to have a male and female uh, to produce fruited branches. 
And so we have a male uh, pollinator for each of the female varieties mm -hmm. here. And we generally start selling this in November uh, up through the Christmas winter season. Uh, this year we had people asking for it in October. Wow. So another month ahead of time. Were and they so ready? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, actually we had a order go out to a wholesale house in, in uh, Utah hmm. in uh, right after uh, about mid-September. Oh, wow. Where the berries were just mainly green with a little bit of red, a little bit of pink. They were just starting to form colors. and she thought of that as an autumn autumn mm -hmm. berry. Mm -hmm. um, so next year we may bump it up to September. Oh yeah. Um, the problem with that though is we sell it quickly. Mm. Yeah. So uh, we're just winding this crop up and we have two um, 300 foot rows of it. Um, and then we've got the males um, kind of staggered mm -hmm. in those rows. Uh, so generally you have like one male plant to about six to eight female mm. plants. So you don't need like every other one or something like that. A harem, if you will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we do a, a pretty good uh, pruning, uh, pruning as far as harvesting. And we have these planted about every five foot of, down the rows. Mm -hmm. And then the rows are about six foot across from each other. So we've got uh, a sizable amount of uh, production in these. And do they regrow every year to, to harvest? Or no. So what you do is, like for instance, this uh, branch that we cut uh, this year, um, this was probably a, about five foot high, four foot high. So we cut that back and leave the older growth. So next spring, when they start to bud out, we'll get all these nice straight stems coming out uh, mm -hmm. from below where it was cut. Mm -hmm. And then those will be harvested the following year. Okay. And so the lady, when you um, when you sent them out to uh -huh. Utah, how did they know that the color would be what they wanted? I posted a video on Facebook. Oh, you ah. made the mistake yeah. of <laughs> yeah. telling people. Yes, because I, I wish I would, we have a lot of people that buy specifically from us uh -huh. on this particular crop. And I was just giving them basically a Facebook update oh. gotcha. on where that crop was at at that stage in September. I see, I see. And she saw it and it's like, wow. <laughs> That's what I want. Let's sell it now and use it as a different, yeah. in a different form. Very pretty. Hmm. Weren't the cool. leaves still on it in September? Yes. Huh. But that's the customers dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't pl we don't pluck them off at that time. Gotcha. <laughs> Very lovely, and yeah. you'll see these everywhere, I'm sure. Centerpieces, wreaths, mm -hmm. yeah, all, all for sorts the holiday of season. beautiful decorations. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. All right, Jen, you're up. Okay, and I brought, um, this is an amaryllis kit that I picked up this week, and it says on it, just add water and enjoy. And you know, they are really easy, but something to pay attention to in the store is that this pot has no drainage holes, and that's gonna cause a huge problem uh, when you go to water this and you discover that you're Emerald's bulb was rotting away. So let's take a look at what it is inside. Um, it's I've kind of taken it out, but this is the bulb, and it should be into this potting mix with about a third of the bulb showing. And a large flower stalk will come out once you start watering it, and you'll have a really large flower. It'll tend to be top heavy, so while you could add drainage holes to this, mm -hmm. I would suggest um, potting it in a heavier pot, just ceramic, ceramic or, or mm -hmm. a clay pot. And you can put this out in the summer and it'll just be foliage and then stop watering it in September, let it die back, and you can start the process all over again next Christmas. Awesome. So uh, make sure you've got a pot with good drainage and mm -hmm. something heavy. Yep. Okay. All and right. leave the leaves. And leave the yeah. leaves alone. <laughs> yes. Leave the leaves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right, Chuck, we're back to you. Okay. Well, just to go a step further, we talked about some of the mainstream seed companies, but they're uh, happily, mostly happily, <laughs> heirlooms have come back into fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, seed Savers and Kent Whaley and, 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 and that group uh, kind of repopularized them starting late 70s and into the 80s and and now just about everything will have some older varieties in it um, and then there are some some that are are dedicated to only heirlooms and and kind of almost preach against anything else and and some people get upset with that um, 
Can you explain a little bit about what an heirloom is, just for? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> strictly speaking, an heirloom would be something that's been kept by a family or by an ethnic group and, 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 and just reproduced mm -hmm. by seed for years and years. Gotcha. Uh, some of them, you know, you talk about immigrants when they came through Ellis Island might have seeds under the brim of their hat or mm -hmm. under the stamp in an envelope. And, you know, this all comes with clever <laughs> smuggling techniques. Uh, we probably shouldn't be <coughs> encouraging that. Uh, but, th but then, you know, you get, you know, German Johnson tomato and, mm -hmm. and some of these things or, or Mrs. Kirksey's purple pepper. You know, it's uh, they, they get named by the person you got them from gotcha. or, by, or by what group they're using for. And, and sometimes uh, ethnic cuisines work better with the specific varieties mm -hmm. that, 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 that ethnicity worked with. Um, so anyway, they, the <coughs> strictly speaking, that's what they are. They're, they're old varieties that have been handed down. Now, you can also have antique varieties which were in seed catalogs 100 years ago mm -hmm. and have been ma maintained more or less that way. And those are the ones that were disappearing in the 70s as seed companies got, got uh, consolidated and everything was about hybrids because you control a hybrid because you have the two parents, you make the hybridization, you plant that and it doesn't come true from seed. So gotcha. you've got, got built in, built in uh, clientele every year. So uh, the money was in not doing things that people could save seeds from. Gotcha. So now that that's back in, in style, even some of those older, older varieties, op older open pollinated varieties are, are, are popularized. <clears throat> the thing you have to remember, and I think Jen would certainly, certainly agree with this, is just because it's old and has a great story yes. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy for you to grow mm -hmm. or, or that it's going to work in, in the way you, you mm -hmm. do things. Mm -hmm. you know? Some of the best tasting old tomatoes are, are disease prone. Um, uh, up to a third or maybe even more of the of the actual fruit is going to be green and hard and mm -hmm. funny. Um, the yield itself can be the, really The yield low. itself can be bad. Uh, they've gotten around that a bit. It's expensive, but you can buy grafted mm -hmm. tomatoes that I are put on, that on resistant rootstocks. And so oh. you can get the benefit of, of, of the tomato that you want mm -hmm. on a rootstock that's, that's resistant to those things we talked about wow. earlier. The, the, Fusarium verticillium nematodes and all of those things, so you, you can kind of boost the production that way. But even even then, they're they're, slot, they're shy producers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, in some to some extent, the flavor that you that you love is dependent on a high ratio of leaves to fruits, mm -hmm. and so you have lots of leaves pumping sugars and good things mm -hmm. into a relatively small number of fruits. Okay. Yes, they may be a pound and a half or two pounds. <laughs> they may be huge fruits. But having that that disproportionate sure. foliage mm -hmm. to fruit is, is is part of what what does that, and and it kind of goes through all these things. Um, certainly, if if you want uh, authentic flavors, or mm -hmm. like I mentioned earlier, if you want something that Thomas Jefferson grew, uh, Monticello actually has a line of things that that uh -huh. they have that are documented that were in his in his garden book, and so there are all sorts of reasons why you might want to grow them. Um, just understand. There just may understand be that that, mm -hmm. it, that that success is not guaranteed, and there, there's, especially in some cases, some of the more disease-prone things mm -hmm. like tomatoes. Uh, there's a reason why they've been selected and hybridized mm -hmm. and and and, mm -hmm. and played with to to try to get them to survive <laughs> in old gardens. But wow, there's the science behind that just fascinates me. I mean. We've only got so much time, but <laughs> yeah. we could, I, I could just listen to that all day because it's so fascinating how far we've come, you mm -hmm. know, to, to get those higher mm -hmm. yields and better tastes and, and disease resistance. And well, and the, and, the, and the positive benefit of having them popular <coughs> again is that it keeps a broader genetic base. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if we only <coughs> have the corporate hybrids available, then the gene pool is very small. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we have some of these things that we can interbreed 
and, and, yeah. and maybe mm -hmm. get, the, get the resistance into something that's, right. that's, that's better. I've seen that with tomatoes, where there are some companies that are using some of the more popular heirloom tomatoes as parents mm -hmm. right. in a hybrid. So you're trying to like maintain those good yes. flavor characteristics, but get something that's a little more vigorous, maybe has some right. disease They, they use brandy wine and yeah. came up with brandy boy, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a hybrid version uh -huh. of the brandy wine, which is like one of the pinnacles of heirloom tomato mm -hmm. taste. Gotcha. So Interesting. There Very interesting. Okay, Kent, we are back around to you with winter okay. branches. <coughs> okay, well, we I brought in just a small sampling of what we are harvesting this time of year. And some of you might recognize... Oh, <coughs> got a tangled mess here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so like these <coughs> three colors are three different varieties. Excuse me. <laughs> of, these are three different varieties of dogwood. Okay. Uh, this lighter one is called Cardinal, and it is uh, for us. It's a fairly um, tall variety. We can get uh, some years. We get up about seven to eight feet on it. Oh wow! And then is we is that a single year's growth? Uh, yes. Wow. Yeah. <coughs> and then we get the red twig, which is kind mm -hmm. of a darker wine color. Uh, that doesn't quite get as tall, closer to five to six. And then we have the yellow twig, which is kind of a chartreuse, mm -hmm. uh, yellow kind of green shade. Uh, and it generally will top out about six to seven for us. Um, when you have, if you have any of these uh, dogwoods in your yard, you want to, uh, to get the nice bright winter color, uh, especially when we have some snowfall, uh, you want to prune them back every year. So you can go down to four to six inches and you can just do them with a uh, hand pruner. And then next year you'll get all this nice straight growth. Some of, some of the varieties will be more branching, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. this red, red twig. Uh, here it has a little more branching on it. Where the cardinal um, will be a little bit straighter mm -hmm. uh, with less branching. Uh, the yellow generally has quite a bit of branching on it. And then we now do. Those are really cool. That's so then neat. we do curly willows. And this particular variety uh, is called golden curls, mm -hmm. which is very similar to the yellow twig dogwood, mm -hmm. the coloring. Uh, this is an upright, uh, wavy um, variety of willow. And we do uh, 12 varieties of willow. Willow is, mm -hmm. uh, in the floral trade, is sold for either the bark color or the style or, or growth habit, mm -hmm. depending on how it is. Um, but we do like a, the Golden Curls, we do a burgundy, which is kind of a burgundy Merlot mm -hmm. chocolate color bark. We do a red curly willow, which is kind of a coppery orange. We do a green, which is a green to kind of a mocha color. Uh, and then we do different varieties of pussy willows and different things like that. So. I could see those in like a, in a vase. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have this one here Ooh. is the Japanese fantail willow. And it's n originally native to Japan. Um, has its name. I've never seen that. <laughs> and cool. so uh, this particular plant, uh, we harvest it once again. All of our branches, we do um, winter pruning for the, to sell the branches. Mm -hmm. So um, this particular one is, has somewhat of a tropical look to it. Um, as you notice, the little bumps on here are mm -hmm. the, where the little catkins will open up in the spring. So mm -hmm. they have like little pussy willows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this particular uh, branch, you can see how many there are and how close they are. Uh, so it gives a different look to it in the springtime. Uh, about 20% of all the stems come out fasciated, which is huh. this fanning, mm -hmm. flattening of the stem. Uh, the other 80% are just basically like a straight stem. Mm -hmm. um, That's really neat. Mm. But as well, this one here starts. Is there any color variation on those, or is that pretty standard? It will be from this color to more of a mahogany okay. oh, wow. color. Gotcha. And so this particular one, uh, what we do is we go through and, and harvest all the fasciated stems and bunch them. And then uh, a lot of this type of work is used for Ikebana design, mm -hmm. floral design work. Um, 
and then the others, uh, the straight ones, we go through, and then we sell those as a variety of pussy willow. Gotcha. So. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, Jen, we're back to you. Okay. Um, I brought a house plant that is just something different. Um, this is a Hoya, called Hoya carnosa, and Hindu rope plant is another name, or wax plant. There's a lot of different Hoyas. This is mm -hmm. just one of the more like strange and unusual looking ones with these sort of curled up leaves. Yeah. There's also a variegated version with the curled up leaves if you wanted even to take it a step <laughs> further. Um, this is a plant that is really, really um, it's under the heading of indestructible because it's pretty hard to kill. Wow. Um, it can tolerate pretty low light in the house and it likes to um, be pretty dry in between waterings. So if you're a forgetful waterer, this is the plant for you. This makes a really cool hanging plant if you've got anywhere where you, like a shelf or a mm -hmm. hanging sort of um, plant hanger. Uh, it does flower. It will tolerate low light really well, but it won't do anything but look like this. But if you get it into a higher light situation, um, either with natural light or, or a grow light on it, it will flower. And I was, the, for years, I couldn't figure out, well, what was going to make it flower? I moved it into high light and nothing, and I kept getting these long, spindly growths off the end, and I thought, well, that just looks like something that doesn't have enough light, and I kept cutting it off. <laughs> and then, uh -oh. <laughs> see, I violated my, I violated exactly what I tell people, like, do your research before you, and I wasn't doing any research. <laughs> and so then I finally decided to ask Google what was going on, and I found a number of references to that would have been the flowers that were forming. That? And so then oh. I finally left it alone. <laughs> and what you end up with is where the name wax plant comes from. The flowers look like they're carved out of wax, and they're really oh. beautiful, and they're in, in a cluster. And they smell, on this particular one, they smell like chocolate. Interesting. So, so it will only flower, is it, it only supposed to flower at the end? Or yeah, it'll tend to flower each year from the same point. Gotcha. And if I had the guts to do it, I could cut this back and encourage it to branch and, and propagate what I cut off. And mm -hmm. I just haven't had the guts to do that yet. Um, <laughs> Snip, why but it does. Tend, yeah, it, <laughs> it does. I was doing it for a long time <laughs> and complaining that this thing would never flower. Some, some of the less convoluted ones tend to branch, I think, a little more. A little than more than readily. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. That's a really cool but looking plant. But it's really though. fun, and people ask you all the time, like, is that for real? And they want to touch it. Mm -hmm. and it one drawback is it does, um, if it's going to get any kind of pest inside, it'll tend to get mealybug, which looks oh. like little tiny cotton tufts. And mm -hmm. you can see there's a lot of places that those oh, could sure. hide on here. There's so that a lot of good spots you'd have on to there. Really, yeah, you'd have to keep an eye out for that. But Very cool plant. Yep. Okay. All right, Chuck, we've got a plant ID question for you. Okay. It's from Kim in Decatur. She says, <clears throat> this started with just five plants. I cleared away other weeds and these plants went wild. Please tell me what it is and if it's poisonous. Well, I'm gonna, the description sounds an awful lot like pokeweed. Uh, we called it inkberry when I was growing up. Um, and and uh, incidentally, my, my niece had a similar situation where one sprung up at the end of her house and she was just, babying it along and, <laughs> and was showing it to me. It's like seven feet tall. It's got these clusters of berries hanging on it. And I said, oh, oh yeah, that's that's uh, pokeweed. Or it's a lovely weed you have there. Uh, yeah, the birds will eat those berries and plant them all over, you know, kind of <laughs> like mulberries. Um, and to answer the, the important question, yes, all plant parts do have, uh, have uh, a, a poisonous uh, thing in them. Um, if, if, you, if you're familiar with the song, Poke Salad mm. Annie, you, you, you can yes. harvest the young sprouts as they come up, but you have to kind of like cook them in three changes of water to make sure you oh. get the alkaloid leached <laughs> out of them. Are you and feeling that, and, lucky? And, 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 <laughs> well, now I gotta hear I'm the not, song. I'm, I'm, well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> so who's gonna sing it? <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one who brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 the, guy, the guy's talking about how, how, how poor this, this person was and uh, her mother's on a chain gang and, and all they had to eat basically was this pokeweed if, if she went out and, 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 and picked it from, the, from the, his, his truck patch. Gotcha. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sounds like it didn't end well. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, um, I, I'm not sure it's, it, I, I don't think it would taste very good, so I don't, I, I don't know that like, it's not like hemlock where, you know, a little bit will get you. <laughs> it, this might just make you sick, but it's best to just avoid it. And, and the berries are going to look um, 
tempting to like small people and mm -hmm. maybe pets or somebody. So you, you might want to be aware of that at least. Just get rid of it. Right? Yeah, <laughs> but by the time it's six or seven feet tall, <laughs> it has a tap root that's that's maybe five or six inches tall at the top and goes down because I've, I've dug them out and, and <laughs> 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 it's an impressive plant and and certainly has you know that folk usage as a as a spring green to mm -hmm. kind of uh, you know get get your system going get, get you cleared out with with some of those vitamins you've missed <laughs> through the winter or at least nice. in the old times <laughs> okay but pro pro probably not an ornamental that you want to encourage too much you know if you if you if one makes you happy then that's fine but not right. something you want to. You don't want to, because because they'll they'll once you have one, then they start popping up all over. It's kind of like honeysuckle on some mm -hmm. of those other things. They, you just can't get rid of them after that. Well, you, because <laughs> if you dig up the tap roots, you can do a pretty good job of it, but that's a lot of work. Sounds like a lot of work. Like a lot of work. Yeah. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay. So we've got just under a minute left. I don't think we have time to get to another question. Well, real quickly, I'll just throw this out there and anybody can answer. Uh, Lisa wants to know when she should replant her lilies in the ground. But we're not there yet. So what mm -hmm. month would you? Generally, you plant, um, I do a lot of different things than what I probably, the consumer should do. <laughs> uh, do as I say, not as I do. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you're growing them for flowers, and I'm you're speaking of a lily, um, like an Asiatic lily or an oriental lily, uh, we plant them once the ground is able to work with. Okay. All the way up till about August, okay. depending on how long it that's is. That's a good window. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so whenever you're able to work the soil, and that's not going to be for a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you for watching and for sending in all of your great questions, and we will see you next time. Take care. Mm -hmm.